Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Sabrina Paganoni. Uh, I'm here from the Healy Center for ALS and Mass General. And tonight, I'm here with Dr. Shah, one of our uh, CIPIs, as well as Catherine Small, uh, who is our patient navigator. And, and we're really happy to be here. I see that people are joining from the waiting room. So I'll just give everyone a second to join. And then we can get started. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. It's really my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Shaw, who is the principal investigator at the Mayo Clinic site in, in Florida. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Sabrina. Thanks for having me on here. And I'd like to say we're honored to be a site in the platform trial. I think um, if, if it's not already, this trial will become one of the most important trials in ALS space. And um, I congratulate uh, Sabrina Merritt and the MGH team for their ambitious efforts of organizing this trial and, and running it. You guys are doing a really good job. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm originally from Ohio. Uh, I did all of my school and training and I grew up in Ohio. Um, and then I got married and got whisked off to Florida, <laughs> which is why I'm now in Jacksonville. Um, so the uh, uh, Mayo Clinic in Florida, if you could advance the slide. Uh, so the clinic uh, in Florida was founded um, initially, uh, just a little bit of history, in uh, 1986. Um, and this was the first uh, site away from Rochester uh, Mayo Clinic. Um, it was the Davis family, which is a large uh, family uh, from Jacksonville who owns the Winn-Dixie uh, grocery store chain. Um, for those of you who are in the South know the Winn-Dixie name. Uh, they donated a bunch of land where the clinic is located now. Um, and at first was just a single clinic building um, and since it um, has grown a lot and uh, they opened the uh, hospital here in uh, 2008 um, in this site. Um, our neurology practice is in the Mangurian building, which is not in this picture, uh, but th that building was opened uh, also recently in 2018. Uh, can you advance the slide? Uh, just a little geography. Uh, Jacksonville is located in Northeast Florida, right on the uh, border of uh, uh, Georgia. Um, it's on the coast. Um, it has a small town feel, but it's actually the largest city by land in the continental US, uh, believe it or not. Um, I measured it once, it's about 42, Duval County borders are about 42 miles wide. Um, and uh, there's a little bit of everything here. We have nice beaches. Uh, we have really nice weather. I think in the past century, it has had a recordable snowfall for only three days in the past hundred years. <laughs> um, and uh, there's, you know, there's lots of rivers and lots of outdoors activities. Uh, if you could advance the slide. So this is a, um, a heat map showing uh, where our center gets patients from. Uh, so not surprisingly, we see patients primarily from the Northeastern part of Florida. Um, some patients are coming from the panhandle of Florida. Um, and we also get some patients from uh, Southeast Georgia. Uh, we do see some patients internationally. We have a few patients in our clinic that are from uh, South America. Um, we also get some patients from Puerto Rico as well. Um, next slide. So I'm going to talk about our clinic. Um, the clinic was started um, in the early 2000s. I don't know the exact year or date uh, by Dr. Kevin Boylan. Um, and he continued to run this clinic um, until he retired in 2018. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Bjorn Oskarsson, um, is the clinic director. You probably, you may know him as one of the lead investigators for Regimen D in the platform trial. Um, I'm the co-director of the LS clinic here. Uh, our clinic sees about 250 uh, ALS patients every year. About half of them are new patients. Um, this is our, our clinics are run uh, in a multidisciplinary fashion like many uh, we have in the clinic. We have a social worker, Jennifer, um, respiratory therapist, Melissa. Um, we have an occupational therapist, which is either Angelica or Amanda physical therapist, uh, Glay. Uh, we have a speech pathologist, Sarah or Amanda. 
um, registered dietitian, Melissa, and uh, each clinic visits about four hours long. Um, and we see about five patients uh, in a half day. And the clinic meets uh, uh, once a week, uh, every week, um, and then two Wednesdays out of every month. And we're likely going to make the clinic uh, two half days a week. Um, next slide. So we have, uh, you know, our clinic is involved in multiple research programs. Uh, we have clinical trials. Uh, we have five currently enrolling trials. Uh, we usually enroll uh, about 20 to 25 patients in clinical trials every year from our site and diff across different ones. Um, since the clinic's inception, we have kept a registry, um, which has grown significantly. Um, in this registry, we collect uh, patient data uh, demographic data and uh, other clinical data that we're measuring in the clinics. And right now we have about 2,600 unique uh, uh, patients in the database. We also have a biospecimen collection program. We collect blood samples from uh, patients um, in the clinic, and uh, this is fed into uh, uh, neuroscience uh, research here on our campus. We collaborate with uh, scientists who are interested in the genetics of ALS. Um, right now, we have about 1,800 uh, patients worth of blood bank samples. Uh, we also have a spinal fluid collection program. We also have uh, a brain bank and autopsy program. And right now, I don't know the exact number, but I think we have somewhere between 120 and 130 brain and spinal cord donations. Uh, and that's one of the largest uh, brain bank and autopsy programs in the world in the ALS space. Um, that program is run by Dr. Dennis Dixon. Um, you know, for patients who uh, have access to a biospecimen program, I highly encourage you to participate in one. Uh, this is really important. Um, and it's led to um, important research here on this campus uh, at our uh, campus and around the same time as uh, NIH. Uh, the C9 or F72 repeat expansion was discovered um, in 2011. Um, and that was just because of the biospecimen program uh, that was going on in the clinic. Um, and so these are really important efforts and uh, encourage you all to participate in one if you have access. And of course, um, I have a pictured here, our uh, research coordinator team. Uh, and if there's any patients in our uh, clinic, you probably have seen all these uh, at least uh, one of these faces. Uh, but Megan, Alex, Colette, Lisa, and Johnny basically run our clinical trials for us and uh, do an excellent job. So that's all I have the prepared uh, if remarks that I have today. Um, but I, I really thank uh, again, Sabrina, for uh, inviting me to uh, talk on this webinar. Um, happy to answer any questions about our site. Excellent. Thank you so much. And as always, we, um, you know, we, we provide uh, updates about the trial and then we can go back for uh, anyone in the audience. You can type your questions in the Q&A box uh, and then we can ask, you know, questions. Uh, we can ask questions about the site or about the trial in general. Next slide. Oh, that's it. That's an important picture. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. This is my thank you slide. <laughs> um, I'll spend maybe 30 seconds here, but uh, you know, most people, uh, when they go on vacations, they are doing things at the beach, and, but this is where we live. So uh, we did the opposite. We went to a, a cold place. My kids have never seen snow before, um, and this is the first time they ever played in snow. This is at uh, Yosemite, oh, of wow. course, in uh, California. Uh, it's a really nice Wonderful. place. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Next slide. Oh, actually, as we start, um, we can uh, switch gears and talk about the, the trial. Uh, I have a question for you, Dr. Shah. Um, somebody is writing in the chat that um, uh, they have a family member who was just diagnosed with ALS uh, and has tried to get an appointment, uh, I believe, at your center at Mayo Clinic. Um, and so um, wanted to, to see how to best connect with you. So. I wonder, you know, what information we can provide and also would encourage the person who wrote to connect and, and email uh, Catherine Small, who's our patient navigator, who perhaps can then, um, you know, connect with you, Dr. Shah. But um, do you have anything like maybe, uh, can we put maybe the, the contact information in the chat? And then uh, also if, if the person who wrote the question can email the patient navigator, that would be great. 
Yeah, I think that would be the best way to handle it. Um, you know, our our urology central appointment office uh, should know to schedule these uh, appointments. We're trying to see new ALS cases within four weeks of receiving a referral. So um, I'm not sure what's going on. I, I think more specific information would be helpful. Um, and I can include our uh, number um, in the chat. Yeah, if you could do that, that would be great. And also I see here that Catherine uh, posted her email. So uh, if you can please um, post your information. Uh, so as you know, at this time for, for the in the platform trial, we are uh, testing five drugs. Uh, unfortunately, the first regimen was stopped uh, because of futility um, a few weeks ago. Uh, but that's actually in a way, um, well, that's obviously uh, negative news that said uh, it's a demonstration of how this platform trial as a whole is um, working on accelerating the time it takes to develop new treatments by uh, as rapidly as possible, um, sort of ruling out the ones that don't um, don't have efficacy and continuing the testing for the other ones. So right now we still uh, are testing Verdiperstat, uh, uh, CNMA weight, and pretopidine as part of the previous regimens that are fully enrolled, and and so we have participants. Uh, completing the double blind for those three regimens and then now receiving active drug in the open label extension. And then we were absolutely excited to launch regimen E, uh, the drug Trialose that's manufactured by Seal uh, Therapeutics earlier in 2022. And, and so the, the enrollment has actually started. So now we're enrolling new participants for the regimen E uh, Trialose trial. Next slide. And Basically, we're trying to do two things in 2022. We are completing the first four regimens while launching uh, regimen number five. For the first four regimens, so regimens A, B, C, and D, we expect the results to be available uh, later this year. Now, because this is a large study, hundreds of patients, where we collect a lot of information about safety, efficacy, and also the number of biomarkers, the database and sort of the data processing um, takes time. Uh, and, and so we're gonna be able, we have a, a very organized and coordinated uh, system uh, to, um, to basically automatically uh, process the data as it comes in, but then we won't be able to analyze the results until all the data has come in. So we need to wait for something called LPLV, which stands for last participant, last visit. That means that, that we had to wait to analyze the data until the last person who is completing the randomized placebo control period completes their participation in that randomized placebo control period. That's projected to happen uh, over the next few months. It, dep it depends a little bit on the regimen and it depends on whether the participant goes on to the open label extension or not because the schedule of activities changes a little bit depending on that choice. Uh, but essentially what this means is that we will complete last patient, last visit over the next few months, let's say in the spring, early summer. Uh, after that, the data is completed, you know, the, the processing of the data gets completed, which means that over the summer, we will lock the database. Locking the database means that the data can no longer be changed. It's all quality, you know, quality controlled, uh, all the checks uh, are in place. And so we can finally analyze the data right after database lock, which means that the so-called top line results, which is really what the, the most important results are going to be available over the summer. Again, there is a little bit of range because it depends a little bit on when, on what happens with the last few participants in the regimens A through D. Over the summer, we will have the top line results, uh, meaning are these drugs safe and effective? You know, and, and we will provide the answer and, and share the results. And then the final study reports will be available sort of in the fall, um, by this uh, early winter, in, in, by December 2022. Uh, and so we uh, obviously were already planning on, uh, you know, preparing sort of presentations and publications so that we can share all the results. Uh, again, there is a range uh, and, and we're already working hard to prepare everything, but the actual data won't, you know, we cannot even look at the actual data until again, we complete uh, the first few regimens. So that's very exciting. Again, we'll have results uh, of, of all these first regimens um, by the end of the year. But again, the top line will be available in the summer, which is really what matters. Um, next slide. 
at the same time, it's important that we continue obviously to enroll new participants because at this time we really want to also test the fifth drug, Trialos, and, and for that we do have to uh, enroll new participants. So I would like to thank you for uh, thank thanks all the participants, uh, all of you who are supporting participants, uh, who are caregivers, uh, or or uh, all of you are raising awareness and, and sharing knowledge about the platform trial, because really it's important that uh, again we enroll new participants uh, so that we can also. Uh, be able to tell uh, if Regimen E works, um, you know, over the next few months. So far, uh, 21 participants uh, have signed informed consent. That's really the first step. Uh, and uh, 12 have already uh, started receiving drug. There is a process. We explained that at the beginning of this webinar series. Perhaps next time we can explain it a little bit more. But essentially, uh, as people sign up to be part of the trial, there is a screening process. Uh, what that means is that they meet with uh, with the local team, for example, a site like Dr. Shah's site, uh, and they need to um, sign informed consent to make sure you know that, that allows them to really get fully informed about the regimen, the schedule, what activities are going to happen um, as part of their participation. And then there's some uh, safety labs and other procedures that need to be done uh, to confirm that the participant is eligible. And after that, they can come back another time to actually start, uh, start uh, the participation in the trial in terms of receiving study drug. Um, so those are the numbers so far. Next slide. These are the sites that are currently activated for Regimen E, uh, and 19 are listed. And actually, as of a few minutes ago, we had site number 20 being activated. So next week, we'll make sure to update the slides. Uh, once again, we continue to update in real time as new sites are activated. So the Spectrum site in Michigan was also activated. So that's in addition to the 19 listed on, on the slide right now. Next slide. And, and we have a number of other sites that are close to activation. Again, Spectrum just moved as of a few minutes ago from sort of this uh, this, this group to the group of activated sites. Uh, and, and there's many more who are basically in the queue. So uh, again, the, the idea is to activate a much larger number, uh, but so far we have 20 activated. Next slide. And you can always check the status of uh, the site nearest you online. If you go, if you use the QR code or use the link, you can um, go online and see which sites are active but not recruiting for Regimen E yet, and which sites are already recruiting for Regimen E. So some sites, like the first one, for example, listed here, is, is active, very active uh, in the trial, and and has participants enrolled in regimens, uh, you know, A through D, but they're not um, active on E yet. In Instead, the second one listed here is already active uh, and enrolling participants uh, in Regimen E. So again, that's the that's how you will know if the site near you is um, is already uh, recruiting for Regimen E. If you have any questions and you want to know more about the status of your site, please don't hesitate to contact Catherine, our patient navigator, who can uh, provide more information. Next slide. And again, this is the information for Catherine and Allison. Uh, and uh, we have QR codes, not only for the for registering for this webinar series, but also I uh, do want to put in a plug for our, our ALS link, which is our newsletter. Uh, it comes from our center. So there's a few um, announcements about our center, but we try to also circulate in, a, a lot of information that's important for ALS in general. So regardless of whether you are a patient at MGH or not, uh, there's a lot of activities going on. Uh, right now with you know potential approval of new drugs and other things so uh, we'll be sure to also post uh, relevant um, information as it becomes available and I'm very excited that uh, uh, Dr. Kuldeep Dave from the ALS Association will join us uh, in just a few weeks as a guest speaker uh, many foundations are supporting this trial and so we we always love having uh, them um, you know on, on this webinar we recently had the MDA uh, and again uh, the ALS Association is up next Next week, and uh, next slide. Uh, again, uh, as always, please feel free to send us um, information about uh, topics that you would uh, find of interest. I do want to um, highlight that uh, we did have a great webinar with representatives from Silos Therapeutics about uh, Regimen E. They explained a lot of uh, important details about the drug, the science, the mechanism of action, and also some logistical information about Regimen E itself. So the, the webinar uh, already happened, but it's recorded. So on the link there, you can see how to uh, get access to the recording. 
And next slide. This is just a reminder that all our webinars are recorded, as are the webinars that are sponsored by the NILS Consortium and the ALS Association. We gave one last week uh, with a few colleagues, uh, as well as um, uh, Phil Philip Green and Sandy Morris. We were so excited to do this together uh, with them, uh, and we're really grateful to them as they are part of our patient advisory committee. So if you want to uh, hear what uh, Philip and, and, and Sandy uh, said uh, during, uh, about EAPs or also listen to, to, to us, uh, you can feel free to check the recording. Thank you. I think we can uh, stop sharing the slides. And uh, there's a few questions for you, Dr. Shah, so I think we can um, get to those. Can you talk, uh, can you talk uh, about brain and spinal coordinations? Uh, what research is being done? Um, is it important for more people to donate? That's a great question. Um... Yeah, brain and spinal cord donations are, are really important. Um, autopsy programs are, so autopsy research is really important for us to learn about the uh, pathology of ALS. Um, we don't really have a better way of doing it in humans at this time to uh, see pathologic changes in the brain and spinal cord. Um, there, it does have limitations. I mean, you're seeing uh, patients at the end stage. Uh, so, I mean, how many brain and spinal cords do we need? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I think as many as we can get, uh, you know, if you're trying to learn about, uh, you know, if you're trying to make a scientific discovery, I think, you know, in ALS is such a heterogeneous disease. I think you need as many as possible um, to uh, make any conclusions from them. Question about an institute I'm not familiar with, maybe, maybe you are. What is your take on body science of Florida who claims to have treatments for ALS? I don't know if you're familiar with this. I haven't heard of it, sorry. Okay, all right. And um, question about the mit metformin study. Are you familiar with the metformin study? I think some of the evidence came from other colleagues in Florida. Yeah, I think that's done out of the uh, University of Florida in Gainesville. Okay. Yeah, I don't think yeah. there's results yet, right? Yeah, I don't. I don't know any results. Yeah. Um, so there's a few questions about the interim analysis, and actually, I think we explained that more during a past webinar. So, Katrina, uh, I don't remember which date that was, but if you remember, if you can post the recording in in the chat. Uh, but just to briefly, there's a bunch of questions, so I'll kind of answer all of them together. So, first of all, you know how. Do, one question, it's a great question. I explained earlier that we only know the results of the trial at the very end. So a good question is, you know, how come we knew that regimen A uh, was futile uh, if it was not completed? Uh, and, and that's because we have a special feature in this trial, uh, which is an adaptive trial, and this is an adaptive feature. Uh, this is a feature that not all uh, trials have, but I think all trials should have, which is to take um, regular looks at the data uh, to, to see if it makes sense to continue the trial or not. Now, the, these looks are, um, you know, the people who can actually look at the data are an independent group. So to clarify, uh, the, you know, because the trial needs to remain blinded uh, and maintain scientific integrity, we, as the people who are directly involved uh, in, in running the trial, we don't see the results. It's an independent group that reviews the results uh, and, and they have access uh, to the data, again, in an unblinded fashion, even during the study. But again, there is a firewall. We don't see the results. They just alert us if there is some action that we have to take. And specifically, if a drug is found not to be effective, they can stop the trial before it's actually completed because we want to use our resources and all our energy to, you know, to really work on the drugs that have a chance of, of success. So that's why we, um, we, you know, we, um, we do that. Um, so there's a few questions also about, uh, you know, again, uh, again, this is a double blind trial, but we were able to see efficacy uh, and, and actually it was an independent group that looked at the unblinded data uh, and the other regimens have passed futility analysis. Yes, they did. Um, and so again, that's, um, that's why, you know, only one was, was stopped. Uh, there's a few 
questions uh, actually for you specifically, Dr. Um, Dr. Shah. Uh, there's a question about if somebody wants to participate in, re in your research. So for example, you know, you just mentioned the Brian and Spinal Coordination. Uh, how, do we, how do people make it happen? Um, who should they contact? And would that be part of, of some sort of, you know, document what documentation is needed? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think the best way to answer that would be to share the email address for our, our research uh, that they can contact our coordinator team directly through email. Okay. Um, okay. And I so can send that to the, in the chat. chat. Okay, yeah. that's great. Thank you. It's another great question about the timelines. Do you expect the top line results to be announced uh, sort of at the same time for the first few regimens or will that be one by one? That's a great question. Now for regimens A, B, and C, because they started exactly the same time, they will be announced together. Now for A, we know that there was a lack of efficacy, uh, but more results, you know, uh, more data, uh, more complete data will be announced. Uh, and it will be again at the same time as B and, and C uh, and, 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 and D. So again, the, the first group uh, will be essentially uh, lumped together. And then for the other ones, they will be um, announced as they come because they started at, at different times. Um, question um, again for you, Dr. Shah, um, can you tell us more about the uh, Mayo Clinic stem cell trial? Um, and, and, and I can answer that it's not in the, one question is why is it not, not in the platform trial? Well, because uh, scientists need to apply to be part of the platform trial. And so I think, you know, so far uh, that, that group has not applied, but I mean, it's obviously a very important research. Maybe you can update us on that. Yeah, um, this this is a uh, Dr. Nathan Staff from the Rochester campus is the uh, lead investigator in this trial. Um, it's a uh, basically looking at fat derived mesenchymal stem cells um, and injecting them intrathecally. Um, we don't have any preliminary data from this trial as of this time that I can report to you, um, but we're still enrolling patients in it. Okay, great. There's a few questions about statistics. Uh, for example, why do we have inclusion criteria? For example, uh, diagnosis within three years, actually for the platform trial is a little bit broader uh, than other trials or why are there um, vital capacity cutoffs, uh, which for the platform trial is 50%, which is actually more uh, accessible than other trials. So, uh, so while essentially the, the questions are, you know, while the platform trial does, is broader, allows broader access than other trials, there are still criteria. So the question is, why are there these criteria? So I want to start answering. I do want to point out that we um, we had a webinar with our statisticians, so perhaps we can also post, post a recording for that. Uh, and we're gonna have our statistician come back to answer more questions about these and also uh, questions about placebo. Uh, but essentially, uh, kind of, you know, briefly, uh, the reason there are inclusion exclusion criteria is because we want the trial to be able to tell if the drug is effective or not. And now we know that uh, people with ALS can look very different from one another. There's people who have maybe small respiratory involvement, people who have a long disease course, you know, they've had the disease for five years or more, people who are more recently diagnosed. And because people are so different from one another, if we were to take everyone, we would need to have an incredibly large and long trial to account for these variants and be able to answer the question, does the drug work or not? Because if, we, if you have people that enroll in the trial that are very different from one another, and then you give drug to one group and, and placebo to the other group, then the variability between people is too large. And so the statistics will essentially will never be able to tell if the drug works or not, unless you were to enroll a large, large number of people and, you know, treat, you know, observe them for a long time. Now, because we want the trials to be efficient, meaning we want them to be able to give us the answer with, um, you know, a good group of people, but not too large. Otherwise, it would take too long to get the answer. Uh, that's why we, uh, we do a lot of statistical modeling to create parameters to be able to, again, be able to answer the question. So I'll have the, maybe the statistician answer that, um, you know, in greater the detail, but but that um, uh, that basically it's that variability uh, that uh, that makes it important for us to have a certain criteria when we enroll people in trial. 
There's an, another great question about statistics, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not a statistician, but we'll certainly take it down as, as uh, our you know, um, list of questions for, for when the statistician comes back. It's a great question. If we have checks for futility, why don't you do checks for efficacy as well? That's a great question. And I can tell you, know, we discussed that extensively. So first of all, in the platform trial, we do have futility checks for all regimens. In terms of efficacy checks, they are optional, meaning the industry partner can either opt in or not. They cannot opt out from futility. So that's kind of standard for everyone. But to look for efficacy, they need to make a decision as to whether they want that feature to be activated or not. It is available in the platform. So far, nobody has wanted to take it. And quite frankly, there are good reasons for that in the sense that this is already a shorter trial than other trials. It's a six month trial and not a 12 month trial. So it's a, it's a it's basically people, you know, it's, it's important that people really think about the risks. In other words, if, if ethic, you know, you, you can run the risk of not having enough data to then support a new drug on the market if you stop the, the trial prematurely. Now, I'm not saying that that will never happen. I'm just saying that it's a risk uh, because, for example, there are other regulations that come into play. For example, having a, um, there are regulations about safety. You need to have exposed a, a certain number of people for at least one year to be able to get approval, aside from efficacy. So approval of a drug is not only based on efficacy, there are also, that's obviously very important, but there are also other considerations. So for example, have you exposed enough people for a long enough time? And so if somebody were to shorten the trial, it's already relatively short, the placebo control trial, six months compared to other trials that are one year or even 18 months. If you were to shorten it even further, um, the risk is that it could actually um, affect kind of the approval of the drug. So I'm not saying that that's never going to happen. You know, we could reconsider things in the future. And again, it's up to the companies to opt in or not. And so far, nobody has opted in. Okay, so uh, I think we took, we got most questions. Um, there's a few other questions. The question about melatonin and vitamin E. Do you have any thoughts, Dr. Shah? Do, do, you, do you recommend melatonin or vitamin E to your patients? Um, not specifically to treat ALS. Um, I mean, I will recommend melatonin as a sleep aid, um, but not, not routinely to in the treatment of ALS. Yeah. Just a great question about genetics. Um, there, you know, there's some data to suggest that people who have a variant in something called ANC13A um, affect progression and perhaps even response to treatments. Again, this is certainly a very hot topic, a very active area of research. Um, and so the question is, should people with ALS get uh, genetic testing? Um, uh, you know, so I, I'll, I'll ask you, that question, Dr. Shah, what do you think about genetic testing in general for people with ALS? I would mention that the gene ANC13 is a gene that affects um, progression. It doesn't necessarily cause ALS, so that's not part of standard panel. So even if you, even for people who get the standard panel, ANC13 is generally not part of it. It may be part of some more extensive panels, but not always. So I just wanted to clarify that. So any, any thoughts on genetic testing? Of questions. Um... So genetic testing in ALS, uh, I offer it to patients um, now that we have some trials that are uh, specific for certain gene mutations, uh, mainly C9, ORF72, and SOD1. Um, I, and it's now, for, you know, we can get it done for free through Invite. Um, so it's pretty easy to do. Um, so I'm, I'm offering it. And, you know, we also have a research program that is uh, also testing these gene mutations. Um, so in patients that have ALS um, and or FTD, um, I am routinely offering these uh, because we have clinical trials available. Um, even in, if there's no family history, um, I, I don't generally recommend testing uh, unaffected family members of patients uh, who have ALS. Uh, just because we don't have any known symptomatic, pre-symptomatic treatments at this time for any uh, pre-symptomatic uh, gene carriers. So uh, that's basically yeah. how I practice. Yeah, and that could change, right? So hopefully there will be pre-symptomatic treatments as well. There is a research study, I believe, uh, the ATLAS study, but, but again, hopefully more of these will become available. 
right? Any last thoughts, Dr. Shah? No, this is a great webinar. Um, I, I haven't watched one of these before, so um, I uh, commend you for doing these. This is really important. Thank you great. again for having yeah. me. Yeah, we'll certainly invite you back. Yeah. And, Thank you. And to everyone, we'll see everyone next week. It's a busy week next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.